Thanks, uh, Vijay and Vidya, for organizing this um, interesting discussion meeting. Um, so uh, I put together um, my slides. Uh, they may not look uniform, but uh, let's see how it goes. <clears throat> OK, um, so I titled, I used this word epigenetics, uh, but not um, full-heartedly, uh, because uh, I'm confused. Uh, the genetics, uh, as you know, is a branch of science that deals with genes and uh, heredity of characters in organisms. Uh, and this is based on Mendel's laws, laws of segregation, laws of uh, independent assortment. Uh, which were rediscovered by various scientists independently later on. Now, in 1942, uh, the term epigenetics was coined, which uh, was described as changes in phenotype without changes in genotype to explain aspects of development for which there was little mechanistic understanding. Um, I uh, often refer epigenetics uh, when I don't have any mechanistic explanation for a phenomena. <clears throat> so um, the process of chromosome segregation, as you know, uh, uh, it starts uh, from G1, uh, where a cell prepares to replicate uh, its DNA. And that happens in S phase, and then uh, there is a, another preparatory phase uh, for chromosomes to segregate during uh, mitosis. So uh, let me uh, give you show you a video. I don't know whether you can hear. These are tiny molecular machines. To understand why we have to zoom out, every day in an adult human body, 50 to 70 billion of your cells die. Either they're stressed or damaged or just old. But this is normal. In fact, it's called programmed cell death. But to make up for all these losses, right now, billions of your cells are designed to essentially creating new cells. Division, also called mitosis. Well, it requires an army of tiny molecular machines. So let's take a closer look. DNA is a good place to start, the double helix molecule we always talk about. This is a scientifically accurate depiction of DNA created by Drew Barry at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research. If you unwind the two strands, you can see that each has a sugar phosphate backbone connected to the sequence of nucleic acid base pairs, known by the letters A, T, G, and C. Now the strands run in opposite directions, which is important when you go to copy DNA. Copying DNA is one of the first steps in cell division. Here, the two strands of DNA are being unwound and separated by the tiny blue molecular machine called helicase. Helicase literally spins as fast as a jet engine. The strand of DNA on the right has its complementary strand assembled continuously, but the other strand is more complicated because it runs in the opposite direction. So it must be looped out with its complementary strand assembled in reverse, section by section. At the end of this process, you have two identical DNA molecules, each one a few centimeters long, but just a couple nanometers wide. So to prevent the DNA from becoming a tangled mess, it is wrapped around proteins called histones, forming a nucleosome. These nucleosomes are bundled together into a fiber known as chromatin, which is further looped and coiled to form a chromosome, one of the largest molecular structures in your body. chromosomes under a microscope in dividing cells. Only then do they take on their characteristic shape. Otherwise, the DNA is more strewn inside the nucleus. The 
process of dividing a cell takes around an hour in mammals, so this footage is from a time lapse. You can see how the chromosomes line up on the equator of the cell. Now when everything is right, they are pulled apart into the two new daughter cells, each one containing an identical copy of DNA. Now, as simple as this looks, the process is incredibly complicated and requires even more fascinating molecular machines to accomplish it. So let's look at a single chromosome. One chromosome consists of two sausage-shaped chromatids containing the identical copies of DNA made earlier. Each chromatid is attached to microtubule fibers, which guide and help align them in the correct position. The microtubules are connected to the chromatid at the kinetochore, here colored red. The kinetochore consists of hundreds of different proteins working together to achieve multiple objectives. In fact, it's one of the most sophisticated molecular mechanisms inside your body. The kinetochore is central to the successful separation of the chromatids. It creates a dynamic connection between the chromosome and the microtubules. For a reason no one's yet been able to figure out, the microtubules are constantly being built at one end and deconstructed at the other. While the chromosome is still getting ready, the kinetochore sends out a chemical stop signal to the rest of the cell, shown here by the red molecules, basically saying this chromosome is not yet ready to divide. The kinetochore also mechanically senses tension. When the tension is just right and the position and attachment are correct, all the proteins get ready, shown here by turning green. At this point, the stop signal broadcasting system is not switched off. Instead, it is literally carried away from the kinetochore down the microtubules by a dynein motor. That's the walking guy. This is really what it looks like. It has long legs so it can avoid obstacles and step over the kinesins, molecular motors that walk in the opposite direction. Personally, I'm astounded by these tiny molecular... All right, so this is just an overview of this um, entire process. Um, my talk will be focused on mostly how chromosomes segregate uh, during mitosis. <clears throat> so, um, so this is just to explain to you that what are the components. Um, so you have in red the mitotic spindle, which is uh, made up of microtubules, polymers of tubulin. And the green um, uh, are the chromosomes, the, the objects that you see in green. <clears throat> so, sorry. So you can understand that there's a lot of dynamicity involved here as the microtubules uh, interact with the chromosomes. The right time. Uh, at the right space uh, within the nucleus. So, um, when the chromosomes are aligned at a plane, uh, just before they segregate, we call this stage as metaphase, and when they segregate from each other, uh, call it anaphase, uh, and then uh, telophase and cytokinesis. So the, the chromosomal attachment site of microtubules, so these are the microtubules uh, attaching to the chromosomes, and this is how the chromosomes look like. Now, this primary constriction, as you see here, um, is called the centromere or the kinetochore. Usually, we refer centromere to the DNA, and the proteins that assemble onto the DNA is called the kinetochore. Uh, it looks like a dark uh, mass, an electron micrograph. So this is what you what you see in humans. But if you look at yeast, um, because the chromosomes are very very small, uh, you see that uh, in all chromosomes are uh, jumbled up like this because they are so small that you cannot see them individually. So you see that these are this is where all the chromosomes are. This is, the, this is a divided nucleus um, during anaphase. This is how the spindle looks like. 
And these are all a kinetic course of the centromeres cluster together. Now, um, and various people modeled um, how it may look like in East because you really don't see them um, as clearly as you see in humans. And it was possible to reconstitute the entire uh, kinetic core in East by purifying each of the components and putting them together. And the model looks very much uh, um, uh, what was uh, predicted. Uh, it's very similar to the structure that was visible by reconstitu reconstituting the micro, uh, the kinetic core. So this is what we see normally uh, in the lab. Uh, the, micro the spindle looks like this. Um, the kinetic cores are clustered together near the spindle pole bodies from where the microtubules uh, originate. And uh, you really don't see individual chromosomes. But what is interesting is if you look at the separation of um, the, the microtubule organizing centers and the chromosomes during anaphase uh, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is east, um, which is about 800 nanometers, whereas in humans, uh, it's not much different here. So um, this is remarkably similar, um, while the centromere DNA is very different here. It's only about 125 base pairs, and here uh, 1,500 kilo base pairs. So it's a huge difference in um, uh, the, the length of centromere DNA. <clears throat> so now, as I showed, that uh, there's a primary constriction. People knew for a long time that cytologically, you can really find where the centromere is. Uh, this is how. If you stain chromosomes, you see them this. And also, uh, you know, if you remove all the um, all the histones from 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 a chromosome, it still maintains a structure which suggests that there is some intrinsic property of DNA that maintains some structure even without the protein. Uh, and you can really see the primary constriction right here. Now, at the molecular level, if you just look at where the centromere should be formed, uh, you see that there is a um, there is a histone protein which is uh, which is variant of the canonical histone, which is called the centromeric histone, which is also called CNPA in um, humans and CAC4 in yeast. That replaces histone H3 and the nucleosome where the centromere is formed. So that's the key difference between the rest of the chromosome and at the centromere, where uh, the centromeric histone H3 replaces canonical histone H3. So usually you see four uh, different types of histones, uh, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, two molecules of each form an octamer. Um, but at the centromere, the histone H3 molecules are replaced by the, the centromeric histone H3 molecules. So it's not, there's a lot of controversy uh, now on whether both molecules of uh, CNPA, uh, both molecules of histone H3 are replaced by the centromeric histone H3 or not, whether centromeric histone, uh, centromeric nucleosomes are octamers or they are tetramers or the shuttle between tetramers and octamers, um, whether it forms a negative supercoiling or positive supercoiling. Um, so I'm not getting into that, but uh, it's it's it remained unclear that what exactly is the structure um, of the centromeric nucleosome and how uh, it uh, uh, constrains DNA, whether it's negative supercoiling or positive supercoiling. But what you see here is at the end terminal of histone H3. So histone H3 are very very conserved proteins from yeast to humans. They're almost invariant, but uh, centromeric histone H3 is the only histone that. Uh, rapidly evolving. So you see that the N-terminal sequences are very species-specific and different from each other. So <clears throat> now um, centromeres um, can be localized to one place, as you see here. So most of the organisms have uh, monocentric chromosomes where um, it ranges uh, from about um, 125 base pairs to about 1500 mega base pairs. 
Um, but uh, there are organisms where uh, centromeres run along the chromosomes, which are called holocentromeres. And uh, uh, no one knows that um, uh, how, how, what is the origin of holocentromeres. Um, holocentromeres evolved uh, about 13 times independently uh, during evolution. There is no holocentromere reported in fungi, uh, but it's present in plants and animals. Um, so uh, one a theory was that probably CNPA uh, localizes uh, centromere to one place, so that's why you see monocentromeres. Um, and indeed, there are organisms, there are some insects where CNPA is lost from the genome, and they have uh, holocentromeres. But I'll show you that this theory cannot be universally uh, applied because we have uh, evidence that that may not be the only reason why holocentromeres uh, have been evolved. So, um, <clears throat> as I said, um, uh, you have uh, histone, uh, this is a, a canonical nucleosome, this is um, CNPA nucleosomes where histone A3 molecules are replaced by CNPA. Um, and as you see here, maybe this is where the centromere DNA is. There are many other proteins that assemble um, uh, onto the centromere DNA, and then the microtubules come in contact. This is in 2003, where there are maybe uh, 20 proteins, and now uh, there are more than 100 proteins that assemble uh, on, uh, on the centromere DNA that were discovered. So, uh, uh, so the kinetochore components were, um, you know, um, identified from various species. So if we take two extreme uh, scenarios um, where we have yeast and humans, you can see that there, you know, the, the, this color-coded uh, uh, coding was done, uh, keeping in mind that they are um, uh, performing similar functions. And they are, as you see, that even when a uh, centromere is formed on 125 base pair um, uh, sequence in yeast versus 1500 kilo base pair sequence in humans, the, 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 the components are similar. So, you know, it was proposed that maybe uh, this is a modular thing. So, where you can have several of these uh, units are assembled together in humans, because in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, there's only one microtubule that binds to a kinetochore, whereas in humans, there are 20 to 30 microtubules that can bind to one chromosome. Now, um, I'm talking about centromeric chromatin, where we're talking about the DNA, where CNPA assembles, other proteins assemble. So it actually, CNPA makes the foundation for all the proteins to come and assemble. And then finally, you have uh, microtubules. Now, um, these kinetochores are now identified from a large number of organisms, both by in silico analysis and experimentally. And what we see that the centromeric chromatin, or the centromere DNA, is probably the most rapidly uh, evolving regions um, um, in the chromosomes. And as you go towards and the outer kinetochore, where microtubules have to come and bind, you see that the extent of conservation is more and more. <clears throat> so, now, if I look at uh, uh, centromere DNA, which is 125 base pair, which is called point centromere because it looks like a point on the uh, chromosome, but most other organisms have regional centromeres. So, so you can see that there is no common theme here, unlike telomeres where you have some, you know, sequence conservation across species, but here you really don't see any magic sequence on which this set of proteins, which are more or less conserved, can come and bind and form a structure which is performing a very conserved function. So this is an enigma that why do we have very different DNA sequences uh, uh, that are uh, performing uh, a very, very conserved function. No, that's what I said, that centromeric 
DNA is evolving very rapidly, whereas the extent of conservation increases as you go towards the outer kinetochore. So these proteins are um, evolving more rapidly than these proteins. These proteins are more or less conserved. Uh, so the, the, this is the extent of conservation in terms of evolutionary uh, uh, distance. And 125 base pairs means just one nucleosome? Sorry? 125 base pairs? It's just one nucleosome. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's, the... that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so one argument was that um, yeast chromosomes are much smaller than human chromosomes, and probably you need more uh, mechanical uh, forces acting on it to, uh, to separate. But I don't know whether that's the only reason. So, cost of the foundational molecule that you mentioned, sen PC. No, sen PA. PA, and equivalent of that is CAC. Uh, they are also poorly conserved. No, they are conserved, but their conservation is restricted to the, the histone fold domain, whereas the N terminal sequences are very species specific. So, one of the hypotheses is probably the N terminal sequences uh, give species specificity and, uh, and can recognize different DNA sequences at the centromere. Done something like put the Pombe sen uh, uh, sen PA into Cerevisiae and does it work? Sen PA or Centromere? No, just the sen PA protein. Yeah. So uh, because it's uh, different and terminal, but does it work yeah. or does it not work? Yeah. So the, see, the, the problem is there, there was a, an experiment that was done uh, quite early uh, where they tried to see whether the sen PA of uh, yeast can complement uh, sen PA of humans and that uh, complemented, but I think it was wrong. Okay, it's probably partially complemented because it's, it's, it's more complex than that. So if you, so earlier you could not deplete the CNP of an organism like humans completely. So even if there are some few molecules of CNP sticking around, that can, uh, that can make centromeres uh, functional. So that experiment was not probably the right experiment. But that created a lot of confusions in the uh, in the area. But later on, people tried uh, doing it in a very close related species, and they don't complement uh, completely. Matter than it's just an accident that they. Yeah. 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 <coughs> yeah. So the questions of this. Uh, Please. Can I ask? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, is there any, uh, does the mechanics of segregation, the so speed of segregation, its uh, integrity, fidelity of segregation, does that get altered by the number of, uh, between the hosocentromeres and monocentromeres? Can you show some data, for instance? Of that? You mean the, 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 the fidelity yeah. of uh, yeah, so segregation? Two or? questions here. One is, of course, the, what is the difference in the mechanics between monocentromeres and hosocentromeres? And the second is why, why question. Does it, uh, lead to better control. Uh, and so it would be interesting to see data on this. Uh, uh, do you have any such thing? No, I, I, yeah. So I'll tell you what I know. I don't work on holocentromeres, but uh, so what was believed that... So, and you said it's uh, been rediscovered 13... 13 times, 13, 13 times. independent times, yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. there must be some driving force. Correct, that, correct, correct. In which uh, which kingdoms are these? Which? So, uh, so mostly in insects and also in plants. Yeah. C. elegans, obviously, uh, so worms. That was the first um, uh, organism where people have studied holocentromere quite extensively. But there are um, insects like uh, cockroaches have, uh, you know, holocentromeres. So, um, so earlier it was believed, so what people have done in C. elegans first is they took CNPA and tried to see by tagging GFP that how uh, they're organized and they see that the CNPA runs along the chromosomes. So, but later on people showed that it's not really the entire chromosome is acting as a centromere, there are discrete sites along the chromosome that acts as a centromere. So they're more like polycentric rather than holocentric. Um, I, I, I don't know that uh, whether there is any mechanistic difference uh, how they segregate because they have uh, metaphase, they have anaphase, and they segregate so as. Easy experiment to do. So why? 
I think people may have done, but I am not aware of it. Yeah. Uh, people have studied how chromosomes segregate, what are the proteins that are involved, they are mostly conserved, except that it, it, you know, uh, there is no CNPA in, in insects, but C. elegans uh, does have CNPA as well, but it still has holocentrum. <coughs> Yeah. 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 The, uh, you mean the? Yeah. Sure. I can send you that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so. So in East, um, there's uh, only one region uh, of 125 base pair in a chromosome that can act as a centromere, where uh, say an H3 comes and binds. Um, uh, and there are about 100 proteins that assemble to form this uh, centromere. So uh, if you take the ratio, it's about uh, 1 by uh, 176 uh, hundred. So, a thousand. So, now what has been done recently that uh, the two groups are systematically deleted uh, centromeres from one chromosome at a time. And the only way that a centric chromosome can survive is by fusing it to another chromosome. So, um, and then that was done for all the chromosomes. So these two papers came recently, and uh, in one in, in one group showed that uh, they stopped when there are only two chromosomes out of 16 chromosomes now, and the other group could uh, show that uh, that yeast can survive with only one chromosome, with one centromere of 125 base pairs, and the entire genome of 12 MB can uh, segregate uh, normally. So. So this showed that uh, the, the, the reason we have 16 chromosomes may not be uh, because the centromeres are short, uh, because of some other reason. So of course, if you give stress, if you put them in competitions, um, then they don't uh, outcompete, so they have problems. But uh, in a normal rich media, uh, they behave the same way as uh, yeast having 16 chromosomes. So um, this is quite amazing. <clears throat> now, the other question is how um, NH3 finds um, this uh, tiny region within the chromosome every time a chromosome uh, duplicates. So uh, one option is that your DNA sequence is conserved, so there is a, a specific stretch of sequence which is recognized by uh, a protein, uh, which is not CNPA, because as you see, histone, uh, histones are non-specific DNA binding proteins. They bind all over. Even CNPA can bind everywhere uh, if you create situations like that. In fact, in many cancers, CNPA is overexpressed, and that creates aneuploidy. So, uh, so there, is, there may be a protein which acts upstream of CNPA, uh, uh, which uh, can bind to DNA uh, in, um, in cerevisia, in, in yeast, uh, and bring CNP and other proteins here. So, in fact, if you just take this 125 base pair DNA out of the chromosome and put it in a plasmid, it behaves like a chromosome, and it can form um, a functional kinetochore, which shows that all you need is the DNA sequence for these all these hundred proteins to come and bind and form a functional kinetochore in budding yeast uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So, yeah, people can FRAP experiment. FRAP uh, for what? For the uh, turnover of the components. Okay. Yeah, you know. So, so uh, people have done. Uh, uh, the dynamics of CNPA loading, like uh, what time of the cell cycle it loads, and how the other proteins of the kinetochore loads, and there is extensive literature on that. So, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, it's quite variable from yeast to humans. So, in each organism, the dependency is different. And the, the, you know, uh, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot uh, uh, new field on that. I can 
uh, talk about it during discussion. So, um, so what we are interested in is uh, generally genome organization and uh, how the genome stability is achieved. Then we look at uh, kind of core assembly, uh, which I'm not going to talk in details today, and also centromere structure, function, and evolution. Now we use uh, various uh, budding yeasts, but these are uh, pathogenic budding yeasts. They're pathogens of humans on plants. Kostu? Um, so, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned the Sen uh, finds one out of 17,000 earthly sites. Can you give some uh, estimates of the time scale there? Within a very no, small? so this is just, uh, if you just divide two uh, uh, megabases, uh, yeah, 125 divided by 125, you get this many sites. So it's just saying that if there are non-overlapping sites, a protein has to find, then there are so many sites out of which one 125 best pair site it has to find within whatever time frame that you are. Talking. No, what I was thinking was one could, if one knows the time scale, one could possibly speculate about the mechanism by which it is, is it diffusive, it is somewhat remediated. Yeah, so uh, I can give you an idea of that, like SNPA is uh, constitutively localized. In fact, the entire kinetochore complex is constitutively localized uh, in in cerevisiae, in budding yeast, where you have this short uh, centromere. But there, um, the new proteins are loaded um, early in S phase when the centromere DNA replicates. So, uh, so when you have one, uh, or maybe if you just wait, I'll come to that and then I'll explain to you. <clears throat> okay. So, and then these are the two centromeres that were historically studied for several decades. Uh, because they were the first ones which were identified in 1980 point centromeres of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and 89 uh, uh, from Fission East, which has much longer centromeres. And what is interesting is uh, the Schizo uh, Saccharomyces pombe has three chromosomes, and the smaller, uh, the smallest chromosome is actually um, smaller than the longest chromosome of cerevisiae, which means. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae has a longer chromosome which can segregate with 125 base pairs uh, than uh, Pombe. So it's not just the length of chromosome that matters. Uh, um, we don't know that why a, a particular centromere length is uh, uh, kind of uh, fixed in uh, each organism. So, but Saccharomyces cerevisiae, if you align all 16 centromeres, you see that these are the three motifs that are emerging. It's called centromere DNA element one, two, and three. Um, CDE one and three are uh, more or less conserved. They're loosely conserved, and they are separated by a very highly heterich sequence of about 70 to 170 base pairs. And there are proteins which can recognize this sequence, can come and bind, and which are point centromere specific protein. Now, if you take a chromosome, you have a centromere, you have many replication origins, and if you take a bacterial plasmid, have one replication origin cloned here, um, then uh, this is mitotically unstable. And if you put it back into yeast, it can replicate, but it cannot segregate. Obviously, it means that this will be mitotically unstable. So if you have two daughter cells, one cell may have both of them, the other cell may not have any, just because there is no active mechanism to segregate equally into two daughter cells. But if we place this 125 base pair centrum here, then this molecule can replicate as well as can efficiently segregate if the functional kinetochore can be assembled onto this. And if you introduce into a yeast cell, then it can actually replicate and segregate almost like a chromosome. So this is how the yeast centromeric plasmid was um, constructed and used extensively for various reasons. Uh, in in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, no. Nothing. So just 125 base pairs. Yeah, no role to play. Uh, 
their unit per chromosome or per chromosome so what was that 17000 something which you showed uh, so that i showed because i thought that is if you have a 125 base pair if i have some uh, you know length of chromosome then it can have that many 125 non overlapping sites which is one, one of them is identified by cnpa every time the dna uh, replicates so yeah that's what right. divided by 125 is it? Yeah, yeah, thanks. So, so this is uh, where, uh, from where I uh, identified centromeres, uh, uh, which is also a budding yeast, but this is a human pathogen. Uh, and uh, what was interesting is uh, that in each of these eight chromosomes of this organism, uh, 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 has about three to five kb long centromeric chromatin, but each one is unique and different. In other words, we don't see any um, conserved DNA sequence motifs if we align these eight centromeric regions uh, 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 of Candida albicans. So uh, that is quite amazing because this is the first organism that uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, that was known at that time that each one of them has a different DNA sequence. So how uh, the same set of proteins can come and bind to uh, different DNA sequences within the same organism was the question that uh, really um, haunted me or us for a very long time, uh, even now. Okay, so uh, the question is how do kinetochores form on different DNA sequences? So now, so what we did is the first experiment, which is very similar to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we constructed a, a centromeric plasmid. We took this 5 kb region and cloned it into a, a, a replicative plasmid having a replication origin. So we thought and tried to see whether this is acting as a mini chromosome like in Saccharomyces cerevisiae in Candida albicans, and it was unstable. But it is stable in cerevisiae, and the same sequence is stable in, uh, in the chromosomal context. So this suggested that the DNA sequence cues are insufficient for centromere identity in this organism. Okay. So, um, and we tried various things here. Uh, we actually, um, uh, it, within the cell, we truncated uh, the arms uh, by adding telomeres here and here and made a, uh, a small uh, chromosome in situ uh, without taking it out from the cell. And we showed that that small uh, chromosome was fine. It could segregate uh, without any problem. But then we took out that 70 kb region from the chromosome, uh, from the uh, cell, removed all the protein and reintroduced back into the cell. And we showed that the same sequence, same length uh, of chromosome, which was stable when we truncated it in vivo, uh, stable, but when we reintroduced it, uh, it was unstable. So, which clearly suggested that the DNA sequence is not enough to give centromeric identity to a region, the context is also important. So, so we stuck on to 125 or gone more? No, so these, uh, these are 3 to 5 kb long. We went up to 200 kb and we could not uh, find any stable uh, centromeric plasmid. We made back libraries, we did a lot of things, but it did not work. Um, you had mentioned that in each of the chromosome, the um, chromatin uh, motif which bind, uh, in which the um, chromatin uh, SNP uh, protein binds. So the motifs are different. Uh, There's no motif that I mean, we could find. So they are all unique sequences. Yeah, unique sequences. So uh, which means uh, for each of the chromosome, the SNP uh, has to be unique. No. It's so that's the thing. So SNP is a histone. So a histone protein can bind to uh, any uh, sequence, yes. right? Because all over we have histones. It's just, it has a histone fold domain. So it binds to that specific sequence uh, in non, 
a DNA sequence specific manner. But there must be something that is specifying it to come and bind, and that's what we are trying to find out. Some, okay, elements. We don't know what is that factor. Okay. And th this is where I use the term epigenetics because I don't know, but you can sell the story. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. We, we did, we yeah. did, and you get... Uh, so, yeah. You uh, get, uh, it depends on yeah. at what stage you want to do it. Sorry, sir. No, yeah. no, I just asked whether you can do whether, pull downs. Whether, and whether by pulling downs NPA, can you get the interacting proteins? We tried that, but you, first you need to know when to pull down when right. during cell cycle, because it may be a very transient event, some sure. chaperon can come and lower. Sure. The, the reason I'm asking this question is that similar kinds of uh, uh, what uh, theoretical questions have been asked for different components in the nucleoplasm, mm -hmm. and they've been always associated with what's called now liquid droplets and so on. Yeah. So is that a line of... Uh, could be, thinking? could be. I'll probably touch up on that, yeah. <clears throat> and the thing to do would be to do pull downs and then do in vitro work. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so it depends on when you are doing pull down. So if we do the pull down uh, today, maybe the, you know, it's so sensitive that we might pick up those proteins, yeah. Yeah, there may be something like phase separation that's going on here. Yeah. <clears throat> so now um, in Candida albicans, um, I I here there may be some uh, sequence cues that's helping CNPA to come and bind, but here there is no sequence uh, cue that we could detect. Now, how is it coming and binding here is the question that we asked. So. Um, the, the first clue that came is, uh, uh, is by studying, uh, uh, you know, if we delete the centromeric region, then what happens to the chromosome? So, 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 this, the, so Candida albicans is a diploid organism, so it has uh, two copies of each chromosome, so like humans, uh, and it has a 3 to 5 kb long centromere. Uh, or uh, we don't know the boundaries of centromere, but three to five kb long NPA binding region, because we could never show the what is the length of the function on centromere, because we could never, uh, you know, form a centromere on a plasmid. So uh, we thought that yeah, so if we just delete uh, and replace a uh, uh, centromere of a native chromosome with a marker gene, uh, then what happens to the chromosome? So what is the fate of, normally if you, if a chromosome loses its centromere, then there is no site for microtubules to come and bind and segregate it. So you would expect that the chromosome becomes unstable and it will be lost. So you get 2n minus 1, 2n is uh, the complete set and if you lose one of the homologs, it becomes 2n minus 1. And we uh, knew that the 2n minus 1 state for this particular chromosome, which is chromosome 7, can survive in this organism. So we wanted to do this experiment on this chromosome. Or, you know, so even if it is lost, we could get the transformants. So that's one fate. The other fate is um, there's no chromosome loss because another region can form the centromere, which we call the neocentromere. So, um, in fact, the neocentromeres uh, were identified uh, from almost every human chromosomes. And this is in 2001. Now, more than 100 uh, neocentromere sites are known in humans. Uh, and these uh, are uh, quite rare cases, but it happens when the native centromere is deleted or inactivated for reasons. So, um, when you did this experiment, uh, in how is it finding some other location? So centromere can form anywhere in the chromosome. It doesn't need to form at the center. It can be telocentric. It can be acrocentric. The reason that it gets that generally it's getting formed at the center is there a specific reason? Actually, it doesn't. It forms anywhere in the chromosome. So, for example, in mouse, all, all centromeres are at the end of a chromosome. Yeah, but in the east, it is at the center, right? No, not really. No, not really? It depends. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. <clears throat> so, um, now, when we deleted um, uh, one uh, centromere of chromosome 7 with the URA 3, 
uh, which is a marker gene, we just removed uh, about 5 kb region. We see that uh, from other experiments, we knew that the, the chromosome is stable. So, oops. so the chromosome was not lost. Now the question is where uh, the new centromere is formed because uh, this chromosome uh, is stable and it did not fuse to any other chromosome. So the other way to stabilize a chromosome uh, having no centromere or a non-functional centromere is to fuse it to another chromosome which has the centromere. But we knew from other analysis that this chromosome did not fuse to another chromosome to get stabilized. So we knew that this is acting as an independent stable chromosome. So the way to find where the centromere is, is to do, is to find where CNPA goes and binds. So when we did that, uh, so this is a chip sick experiment uh, uh, and we tried to see where the new centromere formed. And you see that this is where they formed. So one of the two homologs is retained, so you'll always get a peak at the uh, native centromere, but then you get an extra peak you know, all the time. So this, these are the neocentromeres. This formed on the other chromosome. And you can see the peak size dropped also. But the neocentromere, so we did this analysis in three different chromosomes in large number of transformants, very extensive analysis. And we find that always uh, the neocentromere formed within 15 kV distance from the native centromere. Now, we also tried deleting um, from 5 kb to 10 kb to 30 kb region, and, and this dynamics is always found, that always the neocentromere formed very close to the native centromere. So we propose that, now as I mentioned in the beginning, that here is uh, the nucleus. So if we, uh, if we, if we stay in CNPA, and if we try to find where is CNPA in the cell, we always see them as one punctate signal at the periphery of the nucleus, always. So which means that... So 15 kb is related to loop size? 15 kb is related to? Some loop size, some loop uh, So we, we don't know the loops okay. uh, here because uh, they're probably very small and we just started doing those experiments mm. and, and see what we get. Yeah. I'll come back to that. So, so they're always at the uh, at the uh, periphery of the uh, of the nucleus. Now, um, so you know when we published this work in um, Candida albicans, in the same week another paper was published on neocentromeres in chicken cells, and they always also found that it always formed close to uh, the centromere. So we called it CNPA rich zone. So there may be a zone where there's a lot of CNPA, uh, which, is, which forms a subdomain within the nucleus. And any chromosome that comes in close proximity to that subdomain can have uh, CNPA uh, acquired onto it and can act as a, um, as, as, a, as a centromere or as a neocentromere. So, um, uh, but, and, and the other group called it CNPA cloud. So there may be some something you know some region in the in the, in the nucleus where there's a lot of CNPA. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we are proposing. But yeah, there may be some yeah some properties may be needed. But uh, yeah, so we some other properties we don't know. But there is no sequence. Uh, obvious sequence patterns. Uh, so, so we don't know if, if some other properties of DNA are important, which you cannot really find easily. Uh, so it's so centromeres are uh, the kinetochore uh, uh, um, cluster is always very close to spindle pole bodies, and um, uh, Candida albicans have closed mitoses, so the nuclear envelope never breaks down. A nuclear an SPV is embedded within the nuclear envelope. So, uh, yeah, so they are probably, uh, I'll just come in a minute there. So what are you thinking? One quick question. Yeah. Um, so uh, the DNA at the centromere region is also condensed, right? Or that's not a general principle? Okay, so, so there is no, 
you see, there are proteins. So we don't see any obvious DNA condensation in uh, in uh, Candida albicans, but we have we have been working with another yeast where we can clearly see that there is some sort of condensation. So in Cerevisiae or Candida albicans, we don't see any obvious DNA condensation, right? Uh, there is no um, typical heterochromatin. Uh, th th those components are missing, actually. In the cell. There is no H3K9 uh, methylation. There is no HP1-like protein. There is nothing. So, so when it moves to the neighboring region, it doesn't really impact any gene expression. So um, when it moved to the neighboring region, it uh, so we identified some hotspots, and those are usually ORA-free regions. Okay, so it may have impacted one or two genes, but we don't see any obvious difference. So is that the manner in which it is chosen, that the region is mostly ORF free? No, yeah, so the centromeres, by naturally what we see, where the centromeres are in these organisms, they are ORF free. So it may move to the left or the right, and that may depend upon... Yeah, so it did not move to, so we removed the entire ORF free regions to see where it can form, sure. and it moved to the next ORF free region. How big is the SNPA cloud? How big is the SNPA cloud? How big is the SNPA cloud? We don't know. That's a hypothetical cloud. And is it always present in just uh, yeast or is it present in all other organisms too? So um, the centromeres are clustered are almost all yeast species that we worked on. But, uh, uh, you know, we don't know whether they are clustered at some point of the cell cycle in other organisms. Uh, but it looks like that I just recently reviewed a review on trends in genetics where people are proposing that uh, there are at least some stages of the cell cycle the kind of course come close to each other and they are probably clustered. So, um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Of these you can use this. Uh, clouds. Can you initiate new kinetochore formation and new microtubule attachment? So could this be a way by which you can so um, create ectopic attachments to microtubules? Right. So yeah, if I if you could wait for five more slides, then I think uh, I'll answer your questions. <coughs> You know, since you said that it was 15 KB, you know, you remove one of the centromeres uh, and then afterwards, you know, the next one is going to get formed around 15 KBs. Are you implying that the cloud is like, you know, there is something in the cent high concentration in the center and then it drops down, the same PA cloud? Exactly. That's the, that's the yeah, that is, that, is, that is the idea. Yeah. So we don't know what triggers centromere formation, what determines neocentromere or centromere location. And is it DNA sequence or something else that is required? Has anyone done an experiment by taking the centromere of chromosome 2 and putting it at the same locus as the centromere of chromosome 1? And does it work? That kind it, does, it doesn't work. Right. So, so we have also taken uh, one of the centromeres and integrated uh, next to a native centromere, but it did not work. So the, the native centromere always worked, but the ectopic centromere never worked. Yeah. What I mean is the the ectopic one. Yeah, so um, I, we haven't done that experiment, but I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. When you do the large version, it will not work? No, because, you know, if you introduce an exogenously uh, a piece of DNA, and what we think is you need existing SNPA for it to work. So if you Imagine somehow... the same chromosome, if you create emergence, so it goes very, let's say, from middle of the chromosome goes at the end and... That might work. So if you do that, that might work, but I don't know how to do that in... Yeah, that might. Like in Drosophila, you know, people have done it and it works, yeah. Okay. So um, now we have been interested, I'll come back to these questions. And we have been interested in um, centromeres of ascomycetes and basidiomycetes, and also um, uh, in mucoromycetes, and these are separated from a common ancestor a long, long time ago. Uh, so um, um, 
you know, we work on several candida species, some basidiomycetes and, uh, uh, and mucor, which is um, uh, mucoromycota, so it is renamed as mucoromycota. But everywhere, I don't know whether it's visible, that you can see that in um, ascomycota, all these organisms belong to ascomycota, where you see that um, if you stay in say, NPA, they are always clustered at one dot. So this is a G1 cell, um, this is lattice, this is um, uh, anaphase where the, the clusters segregated from each other. So in every organism you see that centromeres are clustered at some point or the other. So this is true in ascomycota, um, basidiomycota, which is cryptococcus, oomycetes, and also in mucoromycota. What are you leaving? Uh, Saint Pierre. Uh, this is not Saint Pierre because it doesn't have Saint Pierre. It's miss twelve. Oh, which side? Which side? Uh, like this nucleus is about. Uh, uh, you know, this dappy stain nucleus is about. Uh, its diameter is about w w one micrometer. Okay. <clears throat> so this is. This clustering of centromeres, at least in uh, fungal species. Sorry, can you this in live cells? Yeah, these are live cells. Yeah, most of them are live cells. This is. Looking at the dynamics of uh, this in live cell imaging, and uh, I mean, and this is what physicists do in different contexts. So you know, the, since this is an interaction between physicists and uh, exactly, you, know, you uh, yeah. So, so if, if I take a cryptococcus, for example, if you take a G1 cell, you see that um, the kinetochores are unclustered. And as cells enter mitosis, they become, they become clustered, right? So what we are trying to do now is to, so this, this is the dynamics that you see in every cell. I don't know what more you can say, but the other thing we noticed here um, is that normally the nucleus um, comes close to mother bud neck. So this is the mother cell, this is the daughter cell, mother bud neck, and segregate uh, the nuclear, nuclear division takes place um, at the junction of mother bud neck. And then the two masses uh, segregate from each other uh, uh, in, in all, all budding yeasts. But in cryptococcus, what we see that the nucleus moves here, then uh, it divides in the daughter cell, and the one goes back, one uh, stays back. Now, from, from these uh, dynamics, it's difficult to say what's going on, and we are trying to model that, that why should it go to, why should a nucleus go to the daughter cell and divide? But to understand whether there's large-scale uh, chromosomal um, uh, change in the chromosomal looping or interactions, interchromosomal interactions or intrachromosomal interactions, we are trying to get cells only at this stage without treating with any drug, isolate chromatin, do a chromosome conformation capture kind of experiment, and do the same thing here to see whether we can relate why are they are clustering here and not here, and yeah. see the implications yeah. of that. So I was going to say, because we do very similar things on a different context, and one of the things that we can do is do simultaneous imaging, like you say, live cell imaging, and high C, okay, so to try to connect the looping so time dependent high C. Exactly. Right. So yeah, yeah. yeah, that is our yeah. aim yeah. basically yeah. to see yeah. cell cycle state specific yeah. high C yeah. 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 to see how yeah. things yeah. are yeah. moving. But one of the things, I mean, a physicist can go beyond the narrative of saying that, oh, it is once here and then moves there. By studying the details of how that little patchy redness changes in time, you can, for instance, arrive at the fact that it might be active diffusion or or you know some force that is acting on a thing, whether it is surface tension dyna right. dominated dynamics. So there are lots of things that mm -hmm. one can say, sure. which goes beyond the mere narrative of saying, "Oh, something is on the left, something is on the right." Right. No? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so I mean that's one thing. So showing real-time data would be very interesting to the community yeah. uh, here. So I yeah. There is some. There is some. There is some. There is some. Yeah. Cluster. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you need more than no. You think, yeah, yeah. Uh, these kind of dynamics happens in in oil uh, demixing from water, you know, right, yeah. and so much we uh, we know. I mean, the, the patches looks the same mm -hmm, every time, mm -hmm. but there's too much because you can follow the dynamics of uh, the oil water interface in detail. Right. Yeah. And similarly, one can do it here. Yeah. So, so I mean, this organism is quite interesting. Like 
you know, we can discuss it maybe in the next one and a half hour session. And, and but yes, you are right. So if we take really, so we we have tried taking a one minute time lapse for this while the chromosomes are segregating, and I can show you those images. So. so. I think what is causing the sand PA to basically form these clusters? Is it something mechanical or? Uh... That's a great question. So that's one of the questions I have that what keeps the kinetic course together. So I will come from that another context. That, that's one of the things I am very much interested in. So um, now I'm entering into an uncomfortable zone for me uh, as, a, as a biologist because we are collaborating with uh, various physicists here. So as I said that um, these SPVs or spindle pole bodies from where the microtubules come, uh, for some reason um, the kinetochores are clustered very close to the SPVs. So this is a chromosome, so you can imagine a chromosome which is hanging like this, another chromosome which is hanging like this, so this is called the rabble configuration. And as I said, the, the nucleus uh, never disintegrates, unlike uh, mammalian cells in or many metazoan cells in in Candida albicans. Uh, so this always stays, and SPB is embedded within the nuclear envelope. In Cryptococcus, which is a basidiomyces, there is a semi-open mitosis where the nuclear membrane breaks for uh, for some time, but it doesn't completely dissolve. So uh, I am not getting into that today. So now you can think of these uh, beads or chromatin beads as polymers and, uh, and they are arranged like this. So uh, in, in this organism, uh, I, I believe that we need to understand how chromosomes... What you want to say from the previous slide? So I just... So, yeah. So uh, this is how the chromosomes are. And now you can think of chromosomes as uh, chromat as bits on a string model, like nucleosomes that are arranged. And these are uh, these are the polymer. So you can think of DNA as polymer, and polymer blobs are arranged in linear arrays. Each chain represents one chromosome arm anchored to the nuclear envelope, like here. Uh, and what the green? Yeah. Th so these are chromosomes, and only two of them are shown. Yeah. But, okay, but this is not the generic. This is not a. This is what happens in East, probably, because you have this rabble configuration. The kinetochores are clustered close to SPVs, but this is not the way it is in humans, for example. Or maybe at certain stage of the cell cycle, they are like this. I don't know. I'm just saying that in a regular polymer, there would be more number of loops. There are lots and lots of loops. So uh, what you have written is just. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. So, in fact, the number of loops scales with the power of the size of the polymer. And, uh, yeah. So, what we wanted to, I probably, what I wanted to show you here is if we, we can think DNA as polymers and uh, and they are arranged in such a way maybe go to the next one it will be clear that what we are trying to uh, trying to uh, show yeah it, could you be modeling the chromatin fiber as a polymer and not the dna that's what that's what we are trying to do yeah yeah, you you will have probably loops, but okay. Let's let's get into uh, uh, yeah. I, I just took it just to explain that we are not considering DNA as DNA, but it has uh, chromatin the, loops. Uh, here is that, uh, that these polymers in the physical language look like grafted polymers. That is, they are attached to one end, and then the loop statistics is what I said. Yeah. So when we are actually. Um, Trying to model it, we are using this constraint that they are they are together at some point. Uh, so that constraint was used to model it. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so um, okay, so we would expect that there would be some sort of uh, self-organization in the genome by which the kinetochores are clustered together, and we are using Candida albicans as a model organism. Um, so you have. Uh, like uh, three to five KB NPA binding region. If we 
I'm just summarizing what I said, and if we just take this region, put it in a plasmid having a replication origin, it doesn't form the functional kinetochore. Um, and we believe that there is a St. Pierre-Rich zone. If we delete this, then the next region can come in contact and form the centromere. This is based on the uh, dynamics of neocentromere formation that we observed. Okay, so how do you now know that how, um, uh, you know, two regions uh, um, of a chromosome uh, are interacting with each other uh, in vivo, in a, in a cell? So uh, we used a technique called chromosome conformation capture, or 3C, uh, and its variants, uh, high C and other things. And, and these data are also available uh, publicly because, uh, you know, if someone has done this experiment earlier, this data is available, uh, and you can just analyze this data the way you want. So basically what we are trying to find out by this technique is uh, if there are two regions which are uh, far apart in a linear DNA sequence, they can uh, be very close to each other uh, when it forms a loop, and by ligating this and sequencing these circles, you can actually figure out that what is the contact uh, probability between uh, these two points in, uh, in, in, in vivo. So, uh, so this is done in collaboration with uh, Ranjit from IIT Bombay, and we, we just started this uh, work to find out that whether we can get something out of this. So we have, uh, uh, this chromatin is represented a chain made of beads and strings, springs, and then uh, you have this uh, 10 kb, so our bean size is 10 kb of the chromatin is coarse grained into one bead. Uh, all the adjacent beads are connected with a harmonic spring representing the elasticity of chromatin fiber. Uh, steric hindrance is accounted and contacts from high C data between non-adjacent beads are modeled via springs. So <clears throat> now, um, so assume that the contact probability between the pair of beads, uh, which are like 10 kb beads, uh, uh, is i and j, then, then you have, let's say, this cp is about 0.4, then this means for biologists at least, it means that in 40% of the cells, I and J are in contact. In 60% of the cells, I and J are not in contact. And they have done about uh, 1,000 uh, um, iterations where you can, uh, this will mimic uh, uh, the data in equivalent to n number of cells, which can be 1,000. So they have done it now for 1,000 times in which only 40% of them have bonds between I and J points. Um, and then we get uh, something, uh, you know, this is uh, what we see uh, from th that analysis. Uh, so if I show it this way, then it will be clear. So this is from the experiment. Uh, uh, whatever data is available depends on the depth of data, uh, depends on various parameters that how good is the data. So this is how it looks like that here is the genome. So what is plotted here, uh, these, uh, this is a genome, uh, uh, 1400 KB genome, and these are chromosomes. Uh, here also the same thing. Uh, so you are just trying to see how they are contacting with each other. So this part uh, is identical to this part, basically. And you can see that there are some dark spots. Uh, and then if you do this uh, simulation 1,000 times, then uh, it, it looks better like this. So it, what, no, this is experiment by, by doing this uh, experiment. So basically you just isolate chromatin, uh, ligate them, uh, cut it with an enzyme, ligate them, and find out in vivo how they are interacting with each other. So if they are in close contact, they will form a circle because they are in close contact. And then you can sequence the circle and plot it like this. These are asynchronously grown cells. So they are at all stages of the cell cycle. Asynchronously grown cells, so they are in G1, G2, M, all this. So this is not a cell cycle stage specific experiment. So now, what you see here 
uh, are the uh, centromere. So this is centromere of chromosome 1 interacting with centromere of chromosome 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and R. Uh, and that is how you can see. The, so basically this part and this part, the same. Um, so they were trying to do more and more um, uh, repetitions of the same thing to see whether you can get a clearer picture and whether these are believable or not. So it, these are still in the stage, it's very preliminary stage. I wouldn't have shown it in other uh, talks, but they're just trying to see whether it works or not. Now, yeah? The high c data I've looked at, they predominantly report intra-chromosomal contacts and very few inter-chromosomal contacts. So that would mean on these uh, plots, like the diagonal block should be much brighter and the off-diagonal block should be much darker, but I don't see that so much here, right? I mean, you seem to have a lot of interactions between chromosome 1 and chromosome 8 or whatever. Um, so the, uh, yeah. Um, even in the experiment. Even in the experiment, okay. So uh, is this unusual or? Uh, I, I've looked more at mammalian data. I haven't looked so much at yeast. So, I mean, we don't, we don't see much of inter-chromosomal um, interactions um, other than the centromeres. That's true. But what we see is within a chromosome. I'm saying uh, according to your experimental uh, thing, if you look at a block within a chromosome, that would be on the diagonal, right? Uh, yeah. That's one of these yellow squares on the diagonal. Right. And you look at one of the yellow rectangles that are not on the diagonal. I'm talking about the experimental plot. Okay. Um, one of the yellow rectangles that are not on the diagonal, the shade of the yellow seems more or less the same. Right? It's only the diagonal itself is reddish, which means there is sequentially neighboring regions. Yeah. But um, interactions within the chromosome and outside, I mean, across chromosomes are of roughly the same strength other than sequential neighboring regions. That is true. Is that, right? yeah, that okay. is true. Yeah. But so is that expected? I, I, I think so. So, so you know, most of the interactions with, uh, are with neighbors. And then there are very few inter-chromosomal interactions. So, but the question is how uh, weak, in, uh, you know, how weak is the interaction that you can find by using whatever methods you can. So can you improve your detection method so that you can detect all weak interactions or not? So that's one of the reasons, uh, just repeating this thousand times and to see whether you can get a better map or not. And now you can see the signals are better here than here. Whether this is true or not, we don't know. I lost track. I thought this experimental data went into the simulation. Are you getting out so this data from the simulation? No. So this is, this is an experimental data. Fine. What about the right plot? Right plot is they. So let's say from the experiment you get um, the, the two points which have the contact probability of point okay, four. Okay. So that's an input to the simulation. Input and then and then that was done for a thousand times. No, but what do you get out of the simulation then? So what you get out of the simulations is, and so this may be a picture of what you are seeing in one cell, and this is what you get to see in 1,000 cells. Uh, I didn't understand that. I, so, I mean, you put this in and... So, uh, that's what, uh, I mean... So, the, see, when you are sequence. Oh, you just chose a contact probability. Yeah. So for every point, there is a contact probability that was chosen. A different contact probability. Yes. So for, because obviously the, uh, so the contact probability is chosen based on the experiments. But the experiment, as you understand, that experiment was done is asynchronously grown cells. And you get only one data point because, you know, because uh, you get that many number of reads. So that's your probability. Whether that is true or not, we don't know. Right? So now you have the contact probably, the, see that every time they are not interacting with each other, but it's possible that the regions that are interacting with each other in 40% cases, are different regions are interacting with each other in, other, in another cell. Because in 60% cases, you don't know how they are interacting. So either that can be predicted or not. So the interaction that you get 
is based on the number of reads. You, so basically, there is no interaction. So see the genome is, let's say, arranged like this. And now you're basically cutting with an enzyme and like getting it and sequencing it, right? So you, you are actually sequencing a lot of circles that are created. And you get number of reads. So, so if you see that there are, let's say these are 1,000 reads, there are 500 reads, and so on and so forth. So if they are strongly interacting, you get more reads here between the two regions. And if they're weakly interacting, you get lesser number of reads. So the strength of interaction depends on how many reads you are getting in your sequence reaction. These are two hypothetical points where you can see that, you know, uh, you know, uh, so these are two hypothetical points on a chromosome, let's say, and how many, what is the probability that they are interacting with each other? So 0.4 means about 40% says they may be in contact and 60% says they may not be in contact. This is what I understood, but I don't know. Sir, sir just two questions. The first in the uh, coarse grain modeling of chromatin, so the t um, 10 kb they have defined as a bead. Is that so, so? The 10 kb is our uh, uh, bean size. So yeah. that's one bean is about 10 kb. Yes. And uh, we cannot go beyond that. So you need more sequence depth to go to 2 kb or 4 kb. Or okay. Uh, so that is based on the the high sec data, the nucleosome, and the. Uh, based on the yeah, based on the high sec DNA uh, sequencing data, that what we get is uh, the 10 kb is the best we can go. Okay. Beyond that, you know, we have ambiguities. The other one, uh, the second question, um, the number uh, thousand is basically chromatin configuration. So, taking a one chromosome and different configuration based upon the three-dimensional structure, they yeah. So the so ultimately, what we are trying to do is to convert these contact probabilities to distances. Right. So, so if you so let's say your contact probability is inversely proportional proportional to the distance between the two points. So that's what we see. So if two points are close to each other, then they will contact more frequently more. than if two points are far apart. Now, so so let's say the contact probability CP is inversely proportional to one by distance then you have to have a proportionality constant to see what happens. So that constant, we don't know what is that constant. So we are just trying to uh, assume some numbers and see why, whether we can get a realistic point. So the, the maximum distance between the two points can be the diameter of the nucleus, if we consider the nucleus as a sphere all the time, right? Yes. Which is, we calculated that somewhere between 1 to 1 1.2 uh, micrometer. Right? Okay. So based on that, we can recalculate what could be the value of k here and see what are the distances between the two points. Okay. okay. So find, our final aim is to find out whether by using, you know, some methods from contact probability, we can find the distance between the two points, absolute yes. distance between the yes. two points. Okay. There are other methods that are being followed in a cell where, which are larger. Right, so where you can actually do fish experiment to see what is the distance between the two points uh, by fixing one distance and varying the distances of other places. And you can have a matrix where you can put high C data on one side and the, the microscopic data from the other side where you see the actual uh, distance between the two points and see how good they are matching. So there's a recent paper, it's beautiful, where they showed that what is the distance that you calculate from high C and what's the distance that you can calculate from the microscopy and see whether these two, you know, they are, so let's say this part we plot on the high C and this part we plot the microscopy data and they should look alike. Yes. Yeah. So ulti you can do that, but we have problems with our cell size. You know, so we have okay. to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I have a... <laughs> okay, so... Mm, just to understand the model, but maybe you should judge whether this is the right time to talk about it or later. Um, I and J, over what values do they go? They go from 1 to what number? 1400? Yeah, so uh, that is true. So, no, okay. So, 
so that we have chromosomes of different sizes, right? So th these one, each one of them is a chromosome. So the chromosomes are um, between um, one MB to three MB uh, in length. So the smallest chromosome is three times smaller than the largest chromosome. Now, um, I and J are two points on the same chromosome. Sorry? Could be, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, the concern is that, um, uh, so I and J represent beads, and they are going in this figure from, let's say, zero, 1 to uh, 1400. So you have 1400 beads. Mm -hmm. And you're asking which pairs are in contact. Yeah. And you're saying that there is a 40% chance that any given pair, I and J, are in contact with each other. No, now it that, depends. On, so in this particular, uh, we have taken this as an assumption for I and J, but that is not uniformly so true. 40% means a very dark red. So 10% means an impact of minus 1. Hmm. Okay, so um, I think maybe we should then discuss it a bit later. Uh, okay, quite. we can discuss it later because I, maybe I'll just show what we are trying to do. Yeah. A nice stopping point. Sorry? You decide a nice stopping point and then we can take a break. And... Hello. So, um, so if we zoom from here to um, to one uh, area, so let's say this part, and then what we see, these are, uh, this is something what Rahul was asking, right? This is chromosome one versus chromosome one, and you can see what are intra-chromosomal contact points. And if we take chromosome one and chromosome two, then uh, you will see that intra uh, uh, chromosomal contact points of one and two, and also how one and two are interacting. So this is the centromere, and chromosome one and two are interacting with each other. Excuse so, me, sir. Sir, the forty percent which you showed, uh, is it comes from the simulation part also? This is the forty percent of contact probability. Yeah. So the, yeah. See, the, I think this is just an example of if there is 40% contact probability, what it means. So it means that in 40% cells, they are in contact. And it's related with the distance, the points. So that is what we are, yeah, that should be the case in most points, except in certain cases where we see that they are interacting. So the only contact points that we are seeing that chromosome 1 and chromosome 2 are interacting closely is this. So here the contact probability is much higher than 40%. Yeah, thank you. We have this linear distance here. And the question is whether we can um, find the spatial distance between the two points by doing this. So so now if you if you look at it, so if it's red, then they are very close to each other. Uh, and if it's blue, then they're uh, away from each other. Uh, so this is what we could plot. And we don't know whether this is true or not, but most of the time what we see is the contacts are restricted within the centromeres. Um, but we are trying to see whether we can detect any other point where there can be contacts predicted by, from this model, and we can theoretically test it. Uh, we, can, we can do experiments and test whether these predictions are correct or not. In your simulations? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can be, yeah. Yeah, in that particular case, how would the graph, the linear line is going to look the same? What is going to be different there in that case? Uh, sorry, uh, can I just, because there's been a lot of confusion about 40% and all that. 40% is, there's no 40% here. So forget the 40%. He's got a Hamiltonian. 
namely the bring, uh, bead and spring model. Right, can you just show that? You had the picture. Yeah, this one. So now I, uh, you, you have all the energy scales, namely the springs and the, and, the, and the beads. Now you make, let's say, Monte Carlo moves on this. And as for at equilibrium, how many contacts are there and which points are in contact? That is a map that is given. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's no 40% here. Yeah. So the springs are the ones that no. The blue springs, no, given blue a model like are, given a model like this, I can uniquely calculate what the contact probability is. Uh, no, no, I don't I, need any. As other I understand, input. you're not given this model. What you're given is the blue part, which is a chromosome. The red part. No, no, uh, you're modeling this as a bead and spring model. Yes, yeah. but the red springs yeah, come the red from spring. the high C, right? So uh, a red spring means. Uh, there is a contact ah, between those two in high C. You include that. If that high C was 40%, that means in your 1,000 simulations, okay. uh, 400 of them will have that red spring in it. Okay, okay. So it's like a, yeah. uh, it's like a random bond model and then you... It's, uh, right. So okay. if I and J have uh, in, um, a bond, then in 40% uh, in yeah. of your... Yeah, so or 10% or 5% or whatever it is. Okay. What I'm not clear about, but probably a question for Ranjit and is... Uh, how do you insert these bonds while maintaining the uh, requirement that it must all fit into the nucleus? And uh, okay, probably Madan understands that better than I do, but right. No, you should bring. <laughs> sorry, I, I lost. and phone or something. You can get him on Skype. Uh, sorry, Kastiv, I lost the track. So we were talking about the kinetic core. So what's the thing here? Where is this going to the kinetic core and the secretion? Uh, so that's what. So they are. Now you're talking about the modeling of the polymer. Yeah. So then, come to that. So, okay. So what you see is that here all these points that you see, so these are interchromosomal interactions. They are restricted to only uh, or predominantly to the centromeres. So these are the centromeric regions of other chromosomes. This is chromosome one interacting with two, three, four, and so on and so forth. So it's clear that you can easily pick up. Uh, strong interactions of uh, uh, centromere, centromere interactions of different chromosomes, even by high C experiments, which you actually normally see it uh, when you they are, they, are, they are clustered together. So this you can actually detect it by high C, and from there we are just trying to model it. So okay, I'll stop. Maybe yeah. In the last slide. Uh, so your uh, non-centromere regions are just predominantly white. Yes. That Looks is like there is no interaction. Almost there is no inter, uh, interchromosome interaction. There is zero. Almost. That's too low, uh, especially if you have a random polymer model. They should, uh, you know, uh, so this make is, some contacts at least. Yeah, I think this is the problem with this high C experiments. That how do you get very weak interactions? Oh, so all those are very weak, and you just can't detect. That's why yeah, they're all probably right. so. Yeah. Okay. Probably so. Reflection on the key problem of your centromere because some of your experiments. I'm just trying to connect very different dots. You said that near centromere essentially forms within about 15 to 20 kb. Uh, and perhaps that was with respect to one chromosome. Now, if you move on to others, and I stick on to that range, then what's the motivation or relevance of jumping into this, you know, ocean of interactions and trying to get somewhere? I will come to that. In so, the, maybe in five minutes we'll take a break. I'll just finish this part. So, as I said before, that it was very difficult for us to understand that how centromeres are specified, and we are coming back to this question again. So, um, um, so there is no, so normally if you have a centromere, then there are pericentric regions, and the pericentric regions have very specific marks which actually determine uh, the centromeres. Um, so, but here all these uh, heterochromatic marks are missing. So, we are trying to understand that how centromeres are specified here. And as, as it is evident from that data that uh, the, if you look at the mean bulk chromatin interactions, these are trans interactions, which is interactions between the chromosomes and uh, one chromosome with other chromosomes. You see that um, uh, this is what you see, the bulk interactions, and this is what you see at the centromere. So uh, trans interactions at the centromeres are way higher than the uh, 
uh, mean interactions uh, of mean interchromosomal interactions that you see. So obviously there is a strong trans interaction that is uh, that's present only at the centromere. We also looked at what is the cis interactions at the centromere, which means what is the interactions within a chromosome between the two neighboring sites. Now if you if you try to understand that what is the interactions between one uh, region to the next, which is about a 2 kb bin size here, you see that uh, they are higher on that uh, corresponding point if you take a non-centromeric region. So these are a control region or all cis interactions, they are running right here. And if you look at centromeres, then, then they are higher, almost twofold higher at every point we see up to about 24 kb, which is 12 kb left and 12 kb right. Which means that there is stronger interactions at the centromere, even the cis interactions are stronger at the centromere as opposed to any other regions of the chromosome. So which means that centromeres have stronger cis interactions, which is probably why they are more compact or which you cannot see, but you can actually uh, uh, experimentally show that they are strongly interacting means they are compact. And also they are interacting with each other with other centromeres. So these two unique um, interactions may favor centromere formation in, in this organism. And this is restricted within about 25 kb regions from the core. Now to see whether this is true or not, we wanted to do an experiment because we predicted that even from the neocentromere perspective, it, it was uh, predicted that within about 20, 25 kb region where CNPA uh, uh, molecules are probably spread out and that's the uh, zone that we are referring to, whether this is true or not. What we have done here is an uh, uh, experiment where we integrated a uh, marker gene at various sites along the uh, centromere. Now, centromeric chromatin is quite unique because um, if you insert a marker gene here, then, um, then this gene in a population of cells, this gene is turned on and in another population of cells uh, it's turned off, which means some of the cells who are Eura plus and some of the cells are Eura minus. And this is a typical feature of centromeric chromatin, which is called reversible silencing. So we wanted to see that if we insert Eura 3 gene at different uh, sites across centromeres, where do we see the loss of reversible silencing? So when we did this experiment, we found that within about 25 kb, um, uh, we see that there is, you know, the maximum reversible silencing is at the centromere core, that's what you expect, and it's dropping quite sharply. But beyond this point, R5 or L4, if we go beyond these points and integrate an Eura 3 gene, we never see reversible silencing. So which shows that, that there, there is some property uh, that's unique to uh, centromeric region, which, uh, which, uh, which makes it uh, different from the bulk chromatin. Uh, so in fact, what we have also tried is we uh, integrated, let's say, URA3 on R4, and now if we delete centromere here, where the neocentromere forms, and we see that neocentromere formed on URA3 now, which shows that by doing this reversible silencing, uh, you are actually priming some CNPA molecules to URA3 gene, and now if you delete centromere, then it preferentially forms on URA3 rather than on these neocentromere hotspots. So this suggests that, you know, some amount of uh, CNPA uh, around these regions of centromere is important for seeding a new centromere, and probably the sequence is not that important. So we'll take a break now, and then we'll come back and discuss.